like I said, my name is Carlos Bossi. You can uh, find me on Twitter at, at Carlos Bossi. Um, you can also find the uh, SQL uh, Pass Performance Virtual Chapter on, on Twitter and, and a lot of other places. So if you need to reach us, uh, there's, there's all sorts of ways to reach us. You can go to our website and register and uh, become a member. Uh, so if you haven't done that, please do that. And you can also email us and find us on Twitter. Uh, next slide, Lorna. Um, if you need technical assistance, uh, you can uh, you can enter a question in the chat in the chat box uh, and uh, ask questions there. I, I, as the host, I'll field questions and then take them uh, give them to Warner at the end of the session. Uh, we're going to save all the questions till the end of the session today, so we'll let Warner uh, Warner speak throughout the session. We do want to finish on time because we have uh, further sessions later in the day. You can only hear us through your computer speakers, and there's no there's no phone or dialing number. Next slide. We really want to thank our sponsor, SolarWinds. They've been a great sponsor for us, and today they're giving away a $50 Amazon gift card for each session. So they'll give away eight eight of them today. Um, so everybody uh, who's registered for a session will will have a chance to win. So thank you very much to SolarWinds. Next. Next slide. And one thing we want to make sure you know is uh, you've heard about the PASS Summit coming in uh, late October. It's, uh, it's the top SQL Server conference uh, in the world. And please register. And when you do register, use the discount code to save $150 off the registration. Our discount code is VC15LHW9 at the bottom of the slide there. And uh, please, please make sure you use that to get, to get your discount. Next slide. And we have a total of eight sessions today. This is the second one. Uh, and what we, so we, we, what we have today is Warner Chavez speaking on building high performance SQL Server virtual machines on AWS and Azure. And you do need to reg register for each session today. But what I'll do now is I'll turn it over to Warner, let him introduce himself and get, get the session going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Let me uh, switch over to my slide deck. So I'll go off to the other one. All right. So, topic for today is going to be uh, uh, building high performance VMs on uh, AWS and Azure. Uh, my name is Warner Chavez, and uh, SQL Server MCM MVP. My employer is Pythian.com, and uh, you guys can find my blog at SQLTurbo.com. Just a really short bio. I've been working with SQL for about 10 years now. I used to work at HP. Uh, I am now a principal consultant at Pythian, which is a data and infrastructure services company here in Ottawa, Ontario. Um, you can find me on Twitter that at Warchav or tweet me something. Uh, you can shoot me an email as well, or you can visit my blog there, SQLTurbo.com. All right, so the agenda for today really, um, I wanted to do an introduction of the main uh, VM models and storage uh, configurations for uh, high performance on AWS and Azure. And what I see most of, uh, of people implementing out in the field with our clients. So we're gonna go about, you know, what are the, the usual VM choices on AWS, the usual storage choices on AWS, and the same for Azure, so we'll discuss the same. What are the usual VM model choices that people pick for um, production uh, for Azure and the storage options on Azure as well? And then we'll finish off with uh, some tests that I did just to compare some of these more popular um, VM choices and some of these storage solutions as well that you can build your VM on, okay? So, uh, let's start with uh, AWS. So the main types that people consider on AWS are usually uh, general purpose T2, uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about what that T2 really is. Um, the compute optimized, which are VMs that have uh, more CPU power compared to, let's say, the general purpose uh, VMs, uh, then 
the memory optimized ones, which have usually more memory, and then storage optimized, which have like really large um, uh, the scratch, what I call scratch SSDs, um, which are like the, um, the ones that you can use just for temporary storage, right? If you restart the VM, they they disappear, whatever you put there, right? So I'm going to go over the special case of the T2 instances on AWS because um, they don't really exist an equivalent on Azure. So it's something that really is only offered on AWS. And they might not be the best choice for like pure high performance, but they are pretty popular with, uh, with a lot of clients. And the reason is that they're more cost effective. So T2 instances, um, they allow for what, they, what Amazon calls CPU bursting. So what it means is that your cores are really running at about 20% um, normal when your VM is running, but if they get pushed, then you get 100% of the CPU power and when it goes back down, it starts to accumulate credits. So really what it does is that during the day when you have your busier times, then it's a, you're allowed to burst over and get all that CPU power. And after the, you know, let's say the the rush in the after lunch when people went back to their systems and everything's died down and like people are starting to go home, then you go back to the baseline CPU level and your credits start to accumulate, right? And then by the time the people come back, to work on the system, then you're ready to burst your CPU again. So this, this might not be the best choice for just pure high performance where you want to have very uniform uh, response times, but it is a popular choice just because you know it's cost effective and it still allows you to have a performance when you need it by using the CPU bursts. And this is something that it's, uh, it's really just unique to Amazon at this point in time where you can do this type of bursting. Now, the other ones um, that are available are usually uh, the what's called compute, memory, or I.O. optimized. Uh, there are more models of uh, instances available AWS, but they don't really apply to um, SQL Server, right? So there's, for example, there's one that is uh, graphics processing optimized for, you know, let's say if you're doing like video rendering or such, but for purely for SQL Server, these are are the three ones that people uh, usually make a choice. So C4 is the latest one from Compute Optimize. It has the most powerful CPUs out of, uh, out of the uh, AWS VM family. R3 is what they call the memory optimized. And uh, these have the best cost per gigabyte of RAM. So usually these will come with, let's say, the same amount of cores that the C4 has, uh, but they'll come with more RAM than what the Compute Optimized will have, right? Uh, and then the IO Optimized has very large and fast, like I said, scratch SSDs. And these are non-permanent. Uh, so when the instance it's restarted, these would uh, disappear, right? So. Um, there are some uh, different storage choices as well. So for example, uh, Amazon actually has more choices in storage than Azure, and, and we'll see the choices of storage on Azure as well. So um, first choice that you get on AWS is just what they call now just general purpose storage, and it's usually SSD backed. And this is very interesting as well because they use the same concept of having um, bursting. So similar to how you can burst CPU on a T2, you can burst um, I.O. as well on a general purpose storage volume. So you have three IOPS per gigabyte, that's the baseline, and then as time goes by, you start accumulating credits and you can burst to up to 3,000 IOPS for 30 minutes. That's 30 minutes on the baseline model. If you get bigger and bigger uh, sizes of storage, then you can burst for longer time. And then the volumes that are one terabyte or more, they don't burst because they are already at their baseline, right? So we're talking about one terabyte. It's 1,000 gigs and multiplied by the three IOPS. So volumes that are one terabyte plus, they're already at the 3,000 IOPS number. So 
the, they don't they don't burst any higher than that. They're just baseline at 3,000 or more, right? This is three IOPS per gigabyte. So this is the more really really the most popular storage uh, choice for uh, that we see deployed really is the general purpose storage because it allows these this uh, bursting and it also allows just you know regular normal performance when the system is down and you don't have to pay for uh, provisioning, right, which is the second option right here, where we say provision IOPS. So that is the most expensive one. The, bit, the difference, though, is that it guarantees the same level of performance at any time, right? So we're talking about um, the baseline is a little bit higher, so it's 30 IOPS instead of 3 per gigabyte, and it is always reserved for you let's say so there's no time that you have to accumulate credits um, there is no bursting either simply you say you know I want to let's let's pick a number let's say 5,000 IOPS let's say I want to pay for the 5,000 IOPS it's so Okay, thank you. I'll just go over what I was saying uh, over back to the provision IOPS part. So, uh, yeah, so provision IOPS is the most expensive choice, but it is guaranteed. So there is no bursting uh, on like uh, the general purpose one. And uh, it really is justified for a business that is 24-7. So let's say something that is has customers globally, and you always need to guarantee that you're going to have that top level of I.O. performance. So it is more expensive because of that, right? Whereas the general storage one, the general purpose one, it does have good, uh, a good uh, burst performance. It's, you know, 3,000 IOPS uh, that you can sustain. Um, but you will have to go ups and downs, right? Because you once you ex ex spend your entire uh, amount of credits that you have for the I.O., then you'll go back down to the baseline, right? So. And you really want to just use this for a business where you know that you're going to have, you know, more quiet times than um, than than other ones that are going to be more busy. And most most uh, businesses do have that kind of pattern where it's up and downs during the day. Um, but if you're again, if you're really all about, uh, you know, this is a performance session. So if you really want to build the most uh, highest performing uh, machine that you can on AWS, then provisioned IOPS would be the way to go. Obviously, it would be more expensive though because of this. Um, and finally, the the last uh, choice of storage that you get on AWS is just the magnetic one. And this one is just, um, you know, it has a, a very uh, low uh, baseline. I think uh, um, Amazon says you can burst to hundreds of IOPS. That's all it says. It doesn't really give you anything um, provisioned or anything like that. And we usually just use these as recommendation for archiving. Uh, or if you have some low priority databases or something that is just dev or, or, or uh, you know, some test that you don't really need to um, have the exact same performance level as the other ones and you want to make them really cheap for the business, that's where you could use magnetic ones. Um, I could see a use case for magnetic as well on an actual uh, production one, but it would just for something, let's say, if you have like an archive file group or if you have a partition table where you know you have to keep, let's say, sometimes financial, for example, they have to keep seven years worth of uh, information, then you could have the oldest partition, for example, be uh, in the magnetic one, and then you would leave, let's say, uh, you could have something like, um, and then you can attach different types of volumes as well, right? So you could have like a magnetic one, and then have a provisioned one for like the newer, hotter data, right? Okay, um, there's something else that uh, we need to talk to really understand how um, 
AWS kind of works with uh, with storage and with network, and it's they each VM has different bandwidth limit, and it's the exact same uh, thing with um, Azure. So Azure has the exact same situation. So uh, they both um, pretty much their storage goes through you know network pipelines. So um, you, your VM's bandwidth is not only going to be used for your network communication, which is very important for SQL Server, obviously, since um, you know it's a client-server application and everything goes through the network. It usually goes through TCP, um, but it's also important because that bandwidth can also be consumed by the storage, right? So different instances that you pick, the sizes have different bandwidth limits. And that impacts your storage performance because that gives you how much, pretty much how how much throughput you're gonna be able to push through your storage. So this can definitely be a bottleneck because you, for example, th there's nothing stopping you on AWS to take, let's say, um, three provision IOPS volumes and say, oh, I want you know 10,000 IOPS for each one of these volumes. But then when you go and you attach them to a VM that, let's say, has a bandwidth limit of only uh, 60 megs per second, then you're not really going to use those 30,000 IOPS that you just provisioned, right? So it can easily become a bottleneck because you can over-provision the storage. And if you don't know what, what the bandwidth limit is, then you could just find that you're never going to hit the full capacity of your storage. So it is something that you need to be aware of. Um, I uh, I put the latest uh, numbers. I don't know if you guys can really see it. Let me zoom in a little bit. I'm just gonna zoom in here at the top and show you guys. So as you guys can see there, that's uh, well, that's the listing from um, AWS's documentation. Uh, I took that one uh, yesterday, so these are these numbers are up to date. Um, and then you guys can see, for example, let's say um, the instance types, if you guys see them there at the top, there's like uh, C1, C3, C4, those are, are compute optimized. The latest models of compute optimized are those C4 ones. So we see, for example, the C4 large, which is the two core model. Um, that has a dedicated EBS throughput. So what, what does dedicated EBS throughput mean? So some of these VMs in AWS, they are they are known as having a de dedicated EBS connection. Okay, some of them will have to come by default with a dedicated EBS connection. Others you will have to pick it as a configuration option. So when you build the VM, you will go and you say, yes, I want to make this one dedicated EBS connection, and that's what we recommend for uh, definitely for high performance SQL servers. So what this does is that when you enable this dedicated EBS connection, or if you just pick a VM that comes with it out of the out of the box, let's say, um, then you get a dedicated connection only to the storage. So you're not going to be sharing the VM's bandwidth with between the storage and the network. So Amazon will do a dedicated connection only to the storage, and you'll have a dedicated bandwidth only to the storage, right? So we can see, for example, the C4 large. It, uh, it uh, the throughput in megabits per second is 500, which more or less translates to about 60. Uh, if you guys see the last column there, 62.5 megabytes, and uh, max 16k IOPS, uh, 4,000. Right. So if we know, for example, when we're building our VM, we sized it up and we go in, and we say, okay, so we're gonna pick a C4 uh, dot. Uh, extra large as our production uh, VM. And then we can go back here, look at the documentation, just be like, okay, so the max IOPS more or less that Amazon estimates is about 6,000. Now I'll tell you guys, these numbers are really estimates. They're not, um, I haven't seen like, you know, they're not like 100% accurate. But you know, you know more or less the, the number that you're going to be there, right? So if if you're looking at you know the max IOPS I might get is 6,000, or the max bandwidth I'm going to get is 93 megs per second, then it doesn't make sense, for example, to provision, uh, let's say, three provision IOPS volumes, each one with 5,000 IOPS, right? Because 
more very, very, very likely is that the C4 dot extra large bandwidth limit is not going to allow you to use that much uh, storage capacity anyway, right? So let's say if you needed that, um, you would have to go and look for something that has higher bandwidth. So maybe you'll be like, well, really, I, I only needed two cores, but I do need higher bandwidth. So maybe, uh, you know, my requirements are actually those 15,000 IOPS that I'm looking at having to buy a C4.4 extra large, right? That one will allow you to have 250 megabytes per second, which is, you know, you're looking there at uh, easily um, about more than twice of what we were getting with the extra large one, right? Um, and you can go up to a max more or less of five, 500 megs per second, which is, you know, it's pretty good. And that would be, I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be cheap, but you can definitely do that. And that would be that one that's the eight extra large over there. So, or, you know, you would be able to read a gig off of storage in just two seconds, right? So if you were dealing with a system where you know that the database is not going to fit in memory and you know that you're going to be doing large scans, very likely you would want a system with a large amount of bandwidth just like that. And then the, the Amazon documentation, uh, it'll give you, it, it gives you the numbers here for the C ones, um, they give you the numbers for the memory optimized ones and, and so on. So you can go and find what is the number that, that uh, you're, you know, if you're interested in a particular VM, you can go in and find their, uh, their bandwidth, okay. So um, other tips uh, from, uh, from uh, just general building some of these VMs on AWS. Um, the larger, the general purpose volumes, the, the numbers of how long they can burst and how long they refill credits, they, they change depending on the size of the volume. So let's say, for example, if you don't, you, let's say you have a database that's only like 100 gigs, but you need it to burst for longer than it is right now, and you want to refill the credits sooner, then you can create a larger, a larger volume just so that it increases your burst times and it decreases your refill time. Okay, so that is something that you can definitely do. Or if you are just thinking of you know long term, you might as well provision a larger volume to begin with so that you can take advantage of that longer bursting and the quicker, the quicker time refill. Obviously, you would be paying more because you're uh, dedicating a larger volume, but uh, you'll get you'll get performance benefits just by having a larger volume, which is something that it's, it's really different, right, from um, just general on-premise uh, storage because usually whatever volume we go and ask uh, the SAN, uh, you know, it, performance might not be necessarily different between a volume that is, let's say, um, five gigs and a volume that is 100 gigs, but the way that the general purpose volumes work in AWS, if you make it bigger, then you're going to be able to burst longer and you're going to be able to refill those credits sooner. So you do get a performance difference um, from um, the size itself of the, of, the, of the volume on AWS, okay? So, uh, and, and the actual times, like the times, that how long they can burst and the time to refill the credits as well, those are, are documented on, on the AWS, so you can, you, can, you can look those up in, in the AWS storage uh, documentation as well. Okay, um, the, uh, the really big, um, uh, really big VMs, and these are for, you know, when you're like seriously building very, very high performance, uh, pretty much the highest performing, performing machine that you can on AWS, there is the option of dedicated 10 gig uh, interfaces. So these will have, um, not only will they have dedicated EVS bandwidth, like I just explained before, um, but they will also have 10 gigs interface that can be used just for the network traffic. So these larger uh, size of VMs are pretty much if, if you just want the top of the line, let's say, of what you can build on AWS, because they allow not only the dedicated EVS storage, but they also allow a 10 gig interface for your network traffic as well, okay? 
And then there's something else that Amazon recommends, which is called pre-warming the, the volumes of your VM. And um, again, this is something that I've, I've never had to do before on-prem. This is something that um, I, uh, I learned about really when I started to work on AWS. Um, and what they say, for example, is that if you are, uh, if you created a new volume when you attach it to window, to Windows, to your Windows server, you should, for example, when you go to format it, you can apply a, instead of you know how we usually pick just the quick format, then we can do like a full format of the volume so that it actually goes and writes to every single sector of your volume, and this will. Uh, warm up is what they call this, will warm up the volume so that the first time that it gets access is uh, already allocated. Um, if you don't do the pre-warming, what they say is that basically the first time that those sectors get accessed, there is some allocation happening and there's a penalty that you pay for it, right? So there's the performance penalty, literally, it's not like on a, a right there in the right Hey, Warren, you cut out there again. Uh, you started cutting out a little bit. Now we can't hear you again. I still can't hear you. You're kind of getting a little bit of the feedback again. Uh, uh, you cut out again. Heard you sit for a second, then you cut out. Well, let me see if... Uh, um, That's better. Okay, I don't really have anything running here on the background, I think. Well, can you guys hear me now? Hello? Yeah, that's very good right now. You're back to normal. You're, okay. you're, back, you're, you're back to normal. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what's up with, uh, with the internet connectivity today. Um, but uh, let's, just, uh, let's just try to uh, keep going, I guess. Hopefully uh, we don't get too many delays because of it. Um, Okay, so I was talking about pre-warming the volumes. So it's, it's like I said, it's basically you get a penalty in performance the first time you access some sectors in a new volume, and this applies to a, a brand new volume that you attach. And for that, you can format it with full format so that it's pre-warmed by the time that you're actually using it. Or it also happens if you have a snapshot of a volume and you restore it to attach it to a new VM. Okay. So in the case of the snapshot, uh, you have some data in the volume already. Obviously, you can't pre-warm it with a full format because then you would lose all your data. So there's a utility called DD um, that can be used, and there's a it's it's really a Linux uh, Unix-based uh, utility has existed in the Unix world for a long time. But there's a Windows version as well, and all it does really is that it takes the volume and it reads the entire volume. Um, thus pretty much just pre-warming it for your virtual machine, okay? So if it's a new volume, you can do a full format, or if it's a snapshot volume that you're just restoring into a virtual machine, you can just use this utility called DD um, to just read all the contents of the volume and pre-warm it by the time that you're actually using it. If you don't, everything still works, but you'll have a performance penalty on first access for those, uh, those volume sectors, okay? All right, let's, uh, let's switch over the gears here. Now we're going to go through um, the other side of the fence with Azure. So let's go through the VM uh, choices. So the Azure doesn't have as many of the different variety of VMs that uh, Amazon has, but they're definitely, there's definitely good choices for SQL Server. So it's just what we're interested in. So. The A series was the first generation of machines on Azure, um, and after the, the A series, they have deployed now a, a D series and a G series, and each one usually has some difference in specs. Um, just this year, they've also introduced a variation of the D series called the DS series. So the DS series is the only one right now that provides what they call premium storage. So 
previously, before the premium storage was introduced, the only thing that we had available for SQL Server storage was just the normal blob storage, right? So you had to create just blob volumes and you attach them and that's it. And uh, blob volumes have a 500 IOPS and more or less 60 megs uh, limit on per high performance SQL servers. It, it was a little bit more difficult because um, usually one uh, blob disk wasn't enough. We were usually recommending people to just stripe them. Now we get in the option of premium storage, which is working is is a lot easier to deploy. It has uh, it's easier to to build as well, and um, and it has lower latency most of the time compared to um, the blob storage. Okay, so that's that's premium storage. It's not available in all the data centers yet. Um, I'm sure at some point it probably will be. But for example, right now, if you're using the East US data center, it is not available. You have to use the East uh, number two data data center um, in the US if you want to use it. So you just have to check. So if you already have some of uh, uh, stuff deployed on Azure, just make sure that if you're thinking of deploying some premium storage, check on uh, the portal and um, you'll see if your data center that you're already working on uh, has it available or not. And if it doesn't have it available, then you might have to deploy on uh, on a different data center. But most of the, the popular ones, let's say, you know, east, west coast, um, there is usually a choice for it. So, And then the DS series and the D series, um, they're very similar specs, actually. The only difference is the one allows the premium storage and the other one doesn't. Um, the G series is a, a step over the D series in CPUs and um, the only downside for the G series though is that it doesn't uh, provide premium storage for now. So I'm, I'm hoping and I'm waiting uh, for the announcement of the GS series hopefully uh, in, the, in, in the future so that we'll have pretty much you know the top of the line VMs but also availability for premium storage. That would be pretty nice. Uh, something that is uh, a little bit uh, different from Azure that I I was a little bit disappointed is that the uh, bandwidth limits are only published for the DS series machines, so only are only published for the premium storage machines. I uh, I asked around. Um, Pythian and myself, we we're part of the Azure Advisors Group on uh, for Microsoft, and uh, I'm asking around to see if I if somebody could give me the bandwidth limits for uh, the G series or the A series, but I, I didn't get an answer um, before the session today. So I, I I don't have anything to share on that front other than um, if bandwidth if knowing the bandwidth limit is really important before you're planning your deployment then I would just recommend to go with a DS machine um, since those bandwidth limits are published and documented. Uh, and then Azure really doesn't have any any bursting capabilities in the same sense that AWS has it, right? So you don't get the bursting of, uh, you know, oh, time is passing by and you're accumulating CPU credits like the T2 uh, instance on AWS. Uh, nor do the volumes themselves accumulate credits and burst, kind of like the general purpose ones on AWS. So, uh, so deployments in Azure are just are just simpler. There's less less options. Uh, pretty much, you just have to pick your VM, and then you pick if you want to use the blob storage or if you're going to pick the premium storage. Right. Um, the really the the main choice that I recommend to most of our clients right now and for for high performance production is really to go with uh, a DS machine or a G machine. And those are, in my opinion, the real options for you know if you're really dealing with a high performance workload. Um, DS obviously has the big advantage of premium storage, but the Gs have faster CPUs and usually more RAM. Per core, uh, obviously this is at a cost, right? So they'll charge you more for a G machine, uh, a base G machine, because it has the new CPUs and it has uh, more memory per core. But if this is, you know, important to you, for example, if you have a database that has to be high performance, it has to be, you know, very uniform response time, and it's small enough that you could fit it in RAM, then you could make the case 
of let's say just deploying a G machine instead of deploying a DS machine, right? If on the other hand you're dealing with a what I would say a normal OLTP or warehouse option where um, you are unlikely to fit your entire database in memory where you know you're going to be doing I.O. Uh, and you do need to have that really high performance uniform response time, then DS is most likely your best choice in Azure because then you're going to want to just, you know, use the new premium storage volumes, okay? So that's why I say if you're, uh, if you're not CPU bound, if you're not going to fit your database in RAM, just deploy on the S right now. It's my recommendation. If you do have that case, though, we do. I mean, everybody here can. We we have you know 200 attendees. We can likely have 200 different types of workloads, right? So you're the one that knows your SQL servers the best. If you do think that CPU is really important for you and it's not a, you know, a really super large database and you think you can fit a lot of it in RAM or the hot parts of the database will stay in RAM, then you might be interested in using the G ones. Okay. And let's uh let's uh talk about um the storage choices for SQL Server on Azure. And again here the story is a lot simpler than the storage choices on AWS. Okay. So there's pretty much just uh, there's three types of storage technically, but it's outside of the of uh, the temporary scratch local SSDs. There's really only two: is the blob storage and the premium storage that I was discussing. So the page blob storage is the classic storage that has been available on Azure for a long time, and this is just the ones where you create a page blob volume and you attach it to the VM. And like I said, the limit is usually 500 IOPS and about 60 megabytes per second, more or less, okay? The temporary scratch local SSD is um, temporary, and like, you know, you restart the server, it disappears. You only want to use it for either TempDB for SQL Server or for the buffer pool extensions. If you're using SQL 2014, then you might consider that as well. And is available right now in three different, uh, let's say, three different storage volume tiers. So the P10 right there is 128 gigs, 500 IOPS. It's very similar. If you guys see the P10, so provisioning a P10 is very similar to provisioning a blob storage, right? You were thinking, well, it's the same amount of IOPS. Um, the, uh, the page blob storage is about 60 megs per sec. The P10 is about 100 megs per sec. So you do get a bit more. Of, uh, of bandwidth with a P10 volume compared to just creating a 120 gig volume on blob storage. And then the P20 and P30 are, are big jumps from a normal blob storage volume, right? We're talking about all the way from 500 IOPS, the next tier is all the way to 2300, and then the P30 all the way to 5000. And then the bandwidth as well, right? We can get 200 megs on a P30 bandwidth. Um, those prices that I put there are estimated monthly. And um, something that is interesting as well, that is a bit different with the premium storage, is that those prices are, are fixed. So in normal page blob storage on Azure, if you say, oh, I'm going to, you know, let's say create a one terabyte volume on my VM, but you only end up using like, you know, one gig out of it, they're still not going to charge you the one terabyte volume. They'll just charge you for the one gig. Um, but on premium storage, it doesn't matter. If you say you want the one terabyte P30, then you kept it for one month, then you're going to charge you the 122 uh, US dollars. Regardless if you fill it up with uh, data files or if you had um, no data in it at all, they're still going to charge you the full price for it. Right? Okay. So these are the bandwidth limits that are published. Like I said, unfortunately, um, I did not, wasn't able to get official bandwidth limits for the G. I really was interested in the G ones. I really didn't care to get the ones for the A because my, like I said, my main recommendation is to either go with DS or G, but I couldn't get them for the G. If I ever get them, um, I'll, I'll put them on my blog uh, and, and, and uh, you know, then we can have like a full set of documentation that can go with the slides. But so far, like I said, it's just, it's not, it's not published. It's not that 
it's you just can't find it there on the website. Um, however, if you are deploying on DS, then these are the limits right now. So as you guys can see, the top of the line really, if you're looking for highest performing. A VM that you can do on Azure with premium storage, then you would look be looking at the DS14, right? Which allows 50,000 IOPS, and you can do that 512 megs per second, right? So, um, if you guys uh, think about it, then let's say for example, uh, if we go back and see the bandwidth, then you know if we deployed three P30. Uh, volumes that's already 600 megs so with three p30 volumes we will already be tapping out on the bandwidth however we could still go up in IOPS right so if you're doing really uh, not a large IOs and you just need a more IOPS and bandwidth is not as important then you know you can go all the way up to 50,000 if you wanted to on a DS14 and some other some other tips that I've uh, I've uh, ran into uh, when building on VMs on Azure. So the published best practices from Microsoft uh, for the data disks, they say you don't put any caching for. Okay. All right. Well, I'm close to just going through the test now. So, all right. So let's just. I hope uh, the internet uh, just uh, doesn't die on me right now. So, um, sorry about that. Um, what I was saying is that uh, the published best practices for data disks is no caching on page blobs and read-only caching for premium storage. And when you're doing striping. They still recommend uh, it sets the stripe size 64K for OLTP to 56K for data warehousing. In addition, you set the column count to the equal to the number of physical disks. You can do this as the striping options. For example, if you're using Windows storage spaces, you can pick those there. Okay, and let's go through some of the tests that I did. I uh, I did some quick tests both for CPU and for storage on some of the main options that I discussed here. I just we're gonna go through the results and then we'll do a recap. Um, so let's go first through uh, CPU. So uh, this is a quick chart. I I uh, did some tests with an application called uh, Nova Bench. Uh, it's free, so anybody that wants to just play around with uh, creating some VMs and, and seeing how they do, you can download the application. It's, uh, you can get it from NovaBench, it's N-O-V-A-B-E-N-C-H.com. And I ran it, uh, since it was testing CPU, I ran it on the CPU optimized on AWS, which is the C4, and I ran it on my main uh, two uh, favorite machines on Azure, which is DS and the G1. So as you guys can see on the results there, um, the G it was the the winner on CPU power. Uh, it uh, it outperforms on CPU even the the compute optimized one on Amazon, at least on my tests. Um, and the, the DS was uh, the least powerful on on CPU compared to. Uh, the compute optimized in Amazon and the G. Now, something to think about there, of course, is that, like I said, every workload is different. So, if, you know, a lot of the deployments that I see, I would say the vast majority of them, while this is still interesting results, most of them have I/O issues and not CPU issues. That CPUs are so powerful right now. A lot of the times, the big bottleneck is going to be I/O before CPU becomes a bottleneck itself, right? So um, it nonetheless, the, you guys can see the result there. The G was uh, the first one for CPU, then the C4 from Amazon, and last it was the DS. Um, all three though had uh, very dis 
decent uh, CPU performance. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say any of them is a bad choice if you're going to build a SQL Server. Any of these ones could be a good choice if you're interested in CPU power as well. And uh, I'm going to share now some of the tests I did with uh, with the disks. So I have there at the top, you guys can see just a, like a summary of the config. So this was a, a machine that was a C4 on AWS, so that means it's two cores. It's a general purpose C drive, so it does the bursting, like I said, and it has a provision IOPS uh, D drive. I created a provision IOPS D drive of 200 gigs. So. Uh, really quick results here, if you guys can see, uh, we hit the limit on bandwidth for AWS is the 60 is the 60 megs per sec more or less, which is what we get on sequentials. On on random with multiple threads, the provisioned IOPS one uh, performs better, which is good. And then the same the the results for the the one thread sequential and one thread 4K. Um, Pretty much, you, 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 the one thread 4K doesn't really apply to how SQL Server works, so they're not a big deal. I would say the only thing that's uh, interesting here as well is that remember that the, the C drive here is the general purpose one, so these numbers are from bursting, right? So um, if I were to run a really long benchmark and deplete the entire credit balance, then we would likely see uh, less performance because we would drop down to the baseline IOPS level. So this is, uh, and this machine, the C4, was EBS optimized as well. Um, this is another test I did on AWS, um, and this one was with an R3 machine. So these R3 machines are, um, are the ones that are memory optimized. And this one has uh, three different drives. So I did a general purpose C, um, the provision IOPS, on on D and and, uh, and then also the scratch uh, space they had on on the Z drive there. So something really interesting, obviously, you guys can see right away is um, the scratch um, space is uh, it got way better read performance and sequential. Uh, I was expecting actually um, better performance from the provision IOPS. Um, drive there, but something to keep in mind is that on, on purpose I didn't make this R3 EBS optimized. So this one is EBS optimized and this one is not. So um, understandably there we get some lower numbers from the, uh, the one that is not EBS optimized. This is a test I did on Azure. So this is a um, the main one there, the C drive, is just the normal boot volume that's on page blob storage. If you guys will see those really high numbers there, it's um, it's the caching there on on the operating system drive that uh, Azure uses. Actually, a very fast uh, boot time here on a G machine. Um, because of this, I found on Azure that the main operating system drive is is really well cached, and then it just it helps with really uh, with boot times of, of the VM itself. Um, and you could install obviously the SQL binaries there. Not that it makes that much of a difference once it's running, but you know that's that's nice. Um, then the the scratch SSD is the one uh, the second one, which gets uh, pretty good performance. Uh, as well, if you're going to use it for TempDB or for the buffer pool uh, extensions, uh, again, the the one thread uh, performance for 4K is is pretty bad actually on on uh, both um, on all on all of them really for writing especially. But that doesn't really, like I said, apply to how SQL Server usually works. You, you would it wouldn't be doing like really small um, one thread uh, uh, 4K writes anyway most of the time. Uh, and then the last one is just, I did a stripe there on the G. So you guys can see, for example, I striped two volumes of um, of normal blob storage on the E and then presented it as the E drive. And that's how we get up to 112 megabytes per read. Because remember, it's more or less 60 megs uh, limit per volume. 
So that's how we get the 112 read because I basically created a stripe with two volumes. And then last, I just did a DS, same thing with a, a C drive, the scratch SSD, and the, the P30, uh, which is the, the premium storage volume there. And it, we just we hit the limit here of the bandwidth for the DS for this particular uh, model. When we go here, you know, we're getting 67 megs per second or so, which is what we would expect from the two-core um, DS volume. Okay, so just a quick recap of uh, it for AWS. So the T2, they have a good price performance balance, but they're not really for high performance critical workloads if the uniform response time is really important to you. If it's up or down, then T2 instances are an interesting choice that you should explore because of the good price performance ratio that they have, right? My recommendation is pick between something that if it is really high performance one uh, and you don't want it to burst, then there's the main choices should be on AWS between a compute or memory or storage optimized one. Now there's something really interesting with if you're you know really looking for extreme performance, you could have let's say a storage optimized one and then uh, just use the, the scratch, really the scratch space uh, for your files as long as you have a bunch of different machines that are replicating. Right, so for example, you could have like an availability group even, and uh, have it uh, uh, four replicas always running. So if one of them dies, you still have another VM that's up and running with the copy of your database. Obviously, you know this is it, it's uh, very, 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 very important if you were going to do something like that that your um, availability groups are performing well and that you have obviously backups, never, 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 uh, you know, not use backups or just think because you're in the cloud that, you know, disasters are not going to happen. Um, definitely, yeah, for production on AWS, you want to pick a, a model that's EBS optimized. If it's not by default EBS optimized, then just make sure you select it as part of the configuration. Um, again, again, if it's truly really high performance where it has to be really uniform, then provision IOPS is the best option. Unfortunately, it's going to cost you, but you know it is what it is. We're talking here about building high performance uh, VMs for SQL Server, not building cheap VMs for SQL Server. So, um, the other uh, note there, like uh, check against the bandwidth numbers. So again, you don't want to over provision and pay more for a storage that your VM is not even going to be able to consume because of the bandwidth. And the same thing applies for AWS or Azure. If the VM has uh, one of those scratch SSDs, then you can use it for TempDB or the buffer pool extension as well. And uh, the recap uh, for Azure. So oh, A-series are first generations. So they've been surpassed by DNG. My recommendations are, again, pick between something on the DS or the G level for a high-performance SQL server. Uh, premium storage, when you're going to deploy it, check against the DS published bandwidth number so that you know that you're not over provisioning or that it makes sense that the bandwidth is not going to be the bottleneck to the storage. Um, if you are using blob storage, we've found that very likely for if you want it to perform well, you're going to have to do some striping. You can do that easily nowadays with Windows Server 2012 just with storage spaces. You know, you can do it through PowerShell, you can do it through the GUI, you attach a bunch of volumes of page blobs, and then you can present them uh, nicely as a virtual disk to Windows with storage spaces now. It's so easy to do. It's a great, great option if you're going to go with blob storage instead of premium storage. And the same, same, same things apply again. Yeah, check against the bandwidth, and you can use the local SSDs. Uh, as well in those Azure machines for TempDB or for the buffer pool extensions. Okay, and then that was that was the material I had for today. Um, I don't know if we have any questions. We still have a couple of minutes. Hey, Warner. Yeah, th we do have a handful of questions, so I'll try to get okay. in as many as we can here in two okay. minutes since we need to cut it off on the hour. But um, I just want to let everybody know that uh, I'll send the questions that we don't answer along to Warner, and he can. Uh, he, he, he offered to put them on, put answers on his blog. Um, but it, you may have answered some of these as we went along. Some of these came in earlier in the session. But basically, somebody said, I don't understand IOPS, so can you can you define it? And can you also reference IOPS performance, let's say, on the, lap, on the laptop? Uh, 
a one terabyte drive, 7200 RPM, what would be the IOPS? Oh, okay, yeah. So I IOPS by themselves are just, you know, the amount of I.O. operations that a drive can do. It doesn't really mean much, you know, if you don't go, if it doesn't go hand in hand with latency. So, you know, we're looking at the ideal situation is to have high IOPS at low latency, right? Because sometimes you'll get like, you know, some type of a storage vendor will say, oh, I can do one million IOPS, but then they don't say anything about latency. So you always want to have, when you are picking storage option, usually there's three things that you want to collect, is the, the amount of IOs that you can do, which is that, the IOPS, uh, the bandwidth, which is how much you know raw data you can throw through the pipe, and then last, you want to collect the latency. And the latency is how quick does the storage come back and say, hey, yeah, I wrote that, right? So those are the three main things that you want to get. Uh, on a normal level uh, laptop, well, I'm not really sure about uh, what uh, a hard disk drive would be right now. It's probably a handful of maybe 100, 200 IOPS would be something that I, I would think uh, just a normal you know, desktop magnetic, right. magnetic drive might right. do, yeah. Okay. Okay, well that sounds like, a, I think that, that answers uh, the question. How about bursting? Can you define bursting as well? Oh, sorry, we're losing you there again. Let me see if we can get Warner back here. I'm um, sorry, everybody. I think we, we did lose Warner this time. So I think what we'll do is sign off at this point, and we'll uh, send him the questions, and, uh, and hopefully he can answer them on his slide. Thank you very much for attending, and be sure to go to the, our next session uh, for the performance of starting starting right now. Thank you very much for attending.